Do the Raiders find their Marshawn Lynch replacement in the first round tomorrow? Is there a 2019 version of Tyler Boyd lurking in FFPC drafts? And what backs and receivers do we like best in this year's NFL draft? Plus, the 2018 FFPC Bare Knuckle Challenge champion Monty Fan rejoins the show to talk about prepping for the BKC, who he traded Damian Williams for in Dynasty, and much, much more. We've got a great show for you. Dave Gerzak is here. I'm Eric Balkman. Stick around. Your High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour starts now. Broadcast live and heard around the world, you are now listening to the most entertaining hour of radio on the planet. It's the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com with your hosts, Eric Balkman and Dave Gerzak. The High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour is your home for football analysis from the best fantasy players in the world. And now, because no one else was available, here are Eric Balkman and Dave Gerzak. With the master rhyme, that's the least behind the video rapper, you know the top driver, tapper. Thank you so much, Rob. Greetings and salutations, all of you Balkaholics and Gerzak and Addicts. Welcome to the latest episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com. I am, as always, your slightly above average host, Eric Balkman, and my co-host is indeed the patron saint of fantasy football, Dave the Dizzle Gerzak, coming up on tonight's show. We're going to help you get ready for the NFL draft this weekend, plus our thoughts on Ben Roethlisberger's and Josh Gordon's new contract, and 2018 FFPC Bare Knuckle Challenge winner Monty Fan will join us to talk dynasty rookie drafts and how he's been able to win four consecutive FFPC main event league titles. Shout out to the chat room right now. Feel free to post any questions you might have in there. On Twitter, we are at HSFF Hour. I am at Eric Balkman. Dave is at, at David Gerzak. Monty is at Monty Fan. Uh, Facebook.com slash HSFF Hour. And, of course, 347-426-3682, 347-GAME-OVA, football at gmail.com. It's where to send us those emails. If you have any questions for us or for Monty, now's the time to send them in. Last chance. We'll try to get to all of them, uh, as well as the uh, tweets and the emails uh, coming up in the fantasy feedback segment uh, later on in the show. It is draft weekend, and I got my draft weekend off to a rousing good start tonight. Had a lovely dinner at the local Applebee's with my wife and two kids. My wife ducked out of there early, left me alone with my five-year-old son, who proceeded to dump a full kitty cocktail all over my lap. And then uh, we spent the next, I would say, six to seven minutes looking for one of his flip-flops. <laughs> it was a banner night. In the Balkman household, Dave. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Did you have a good time tonight? Uh, it was just a normal life. You are gearing up for a big weekend as well, uh, draft weekend. You're headed out of town to uh, take in the festivities. Yeah. Partying with NFL agents, no doubt, as you uh, get close to uh, the, the uh, southern part of the country. I'm sure you're excited for that. Um, are you surprised we haven't seen that many trades so far? I mean, I, I feel like in the past we, we've seen trades like sometimes a week, week and a half beforehand. Now here we are, less than 24 hours before the start of it, and nary a deal is to be found, my friend. Yeah, maybe we'll see a lot more on the day of the draft or when the draft's actually going on. I, I expect to see quite a few. You see some of these mock drafts, and these guys predict like 15 trades, and I'm, you know, usually you get like three yeah. or whatever. So I don't know why they're doing that. But anyway. Well, I mean, I, these I, I, guys I, have been mocking since, you know, we have uh, on uh, the show with Leo Valky, which you can hear on uh, the Score FM on 95.3 and, and AM 1570. Um, we have DJ Boyer from DraftSite.com. He comes on once a week, and he um, has done now 26 mock drafts. He does them throughout the year. Obviously, he, they're more frequent this time of year. He's already got a full seven-round 2020 mock out. So I think that these guys are looking for fresh ideas and, and you know, so projecting trades make it a lot more interesting and more palatable for them. So and, we, and we love reading about it. We love talking yeah. about it. You don't like reading about the draft? I don't like reading about the draft. I, don't, I hate mock drafts. The I, don't, I, don't, I don't, don't pay any attention to – I never look I never look at anyone else's mock draft of who anyone has for them. Really? No. Wow, that's interesting. Why, why, why would you? Yeah, that's fun. It's like 
when everyone puts on a mock draft, to me, it's like they're telling me about their fantasy team. Oh, hey, hey. So then, so then oh, I got Steelers yeah, in the third. Yeah. And then I got this guy here. So then I also had a trade going here because they need this. And it's just like, whatever, man. I never I thought about it like that. I don't that. care. Yeah. about No offense. I don't care about your opinion on that particular thing. It's fine. I think it's a little bit different because there are a lot of people who like hearing about mock drafts more so than like hearing about other people's I, fantasy I, under, I understand. I'm a little more of an outlier. Good, good analogy, though. I, I do like that. Yeah, well, it's... It's just, it's just so, it's a little much. Okay. Yeah. I actually enjoy seeing what happens. Oh, we'll get to see that. You know this I mean? like, then, then you actually, you have something concrete. Otherwise, you're just like, I don't know, fart in the wind, whatever. It doesn't, doesn't help. Well, what's not a fart in the wind is the early bird contest, or sure, contest, early bird promotion going on for the FFPC main event contest. Make sure you're getting in on that before May 31st so you can save money on your team. And you can also get entered in that pros versus Joe's drawing. I already got a question from somebody today, when are we announcing the pros versus Joes? When's that drawing going to be held? And I believe it's right. It's early June. I think it's the first HSFFO we do in June. We usually announce those. When is the uh, main event deadline? I should be looking thirty first. May thirty first. Yeah. Wow, it's coming up. Yeah. Well, it's still a month. But well, it's still up. it is coming up. The yeah. football guys early bird. You have a little bit more time for that, but definitely take advantage of that. Register your team before June thirtieth. Draft it by July fifteenth and get a thirty-five dollar credit. Best ball, super flex, double ups, all available at myffpc.com. And post NFL dynasty startups are launching beginning next weekend. Register for those. I don't know if you saw the FFPC email today. Hopefully you did. But you see that there's some open spots that are just begging for people to, uh, to join in, jump in, have some fun. And that NFL draft this weekend is going to be that much more interesting once you have a little bit more skin in the proverbial game. Monty Fan is going to be coming up here in about nine minutes here on the show. Before uh, we talk to him, let's get uh, a rundown of all the news that has been going on in the NFL. And like Dave and I alluded to earlier, been a little quiet on the Western front right now. However, over on the Eastern seaboard, sort of, the Pittsburgh Steelers have signed quarterback Ben Roethlisberger to a two-year extension through the year 2021, which means he will be locked in as a Steeler through his age 39 season, probably going to make him a Steeler for life. And the uh, fantasy analysis, Dave, on this, I think is, you, you brought this up off air, it's good news for Juju Smith-Schuster. And kind of, I mean, we'll see what happens this weekend. Could be pretty good news for James Conner as well. I think so. I think it's just good for the overall offense, continuity of the team. Uh, they're sticking with things. I need a great quarterback. I, I don't see any fall off in him at all. He still has those 400-plus yards. Passing and losing Antonio Browns would be a big deal, but I think they're going to, you know, James Washington will try and make up some of that slack, and maybe they'll pick a receiver in the draft. You have no faith in Dante Moncrief. Excuse me, Monte Doncrief. No, I, obviously I don't. Okay. All right, that's fine. Um, James Washington, right now, are you at all interested in him in best balls, or is he just a late-round flyer? Yeah, I think I'm interested in him, sir. Sure. He is currently going at the 11.08. That seems a little rich for me, um, but I get it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of targets to go around. I mean, a lot of targets to go around. And Juju was in the spot a lot, a lot last year, so you have some outside targets. I mean, I know Juju probably isn't going to play more outside, but Washington, he's one of those weird guys. He looks like a running back, but he, he, I think he's got some talent. One of the things that made me a little bit skittish about trading for and or not trading Juju Smith-Schuster away off my dynasty teams, Dave, was because of this unknown with Ben Roethlisberger. Feel a lot more warm, a lot more fuzzy, and I don't think that's the IPA talking about having Juju Smith-Schuster on my team right now. It makes a lot more sense, and, and uh, I feel good. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you can trade Juju away. I mean, he's had the best two seasons, you know, rookie and sophomore season of almost any wide receiver ever. It's a, uh, really fantastic. The extra attention he will face from opposing DBs probably balanced out by the extra volume that he is going to get, right? I guess we'll see. All right, fair enough. That's why you tune into this show. ESPN's Adam Schefter reports Marshawn Lynch is retiring from the NFL after 12 awesome seasons in the National Football League. Wait a minute. Ten awesome seasons in the last two, right? Uh, I misspoke, yes. Uh, nine and a half and uh, 12. Uh, will, nine and a half, 12 overall. I will say that we both, when Lynch came back, we were not on Lynch at all. I think we I, I, I was a little bit. Okay. I, I did draft him in a, in, in a couple of leagues, and I picked him up in the third round of, why, why? of a rookie All right. draft. All right, well, I tried to warn people off of him yeah. and never drafted him ever again. He had a few good games for me. He was awful. I didn't regret it. The thing was, he was actually tied for fifth in the NFL in rushing um, when before he had that, that season-ending uh, leg injury. So he actually was doing pretty good, but it's yeah, unfortunate. Yeah. When you're super old, you sit out a year and that while you get injured. That's weird. Yeah. He was the 12th overall pick in 2007 out of Cal. 
Uh, three years in Buffalo before he went to Seattle for a pair of mid-round picks. We all remember his big touchdown run against the Saints in the playoffs, finished his career with just over 10,000 yards and 84 rushing touchdowns. Great player. Though. All pro first team once, made five Pro Bowls. Uh, he retires on the same day that Chris Johnson signs a one-day contract with the Tennessee Football Titans, Dave. So we say goodbye and best wishes to Marshawn Lynch and Chris Johnson. Uh, not really much fantasy analysis here for Chris Johnson, but I think regardless of Lynch retiring or not, we knew Oakland had to do something about that backfield, and this gives them a perfect reason, Dave, to maybe use a first round. How many first round picks do they have? 12, 13, something like that. They can use one of them. Maybe on, maybe on get their three. Maybe they use one of them on Josh Jacobs now out of Alabama. That would be nice. It really would be if, if he's still there. I, I see it's the next little thing. Is there, so what, what, so what do they have, the 24th pick, the third pick? I, you know, maybe if I was paying more attention, they have, the fourth, people, they have the fourth pick. If I was paying attention to these mock drafts, I would know. <laughs> right, yes, exactly. So fourth, 24th, and somewhere else. Yeah, Jim Nagy from the uh, Senior Bowl, as you uh, uh, alluded to, Senior Bowl director Jim Nagy says that Josh Jacobs to the Raiders at 24 is, quote, the easiest call tomorrow night's draft. Josh Jacobs, 5'10", 216. Um, you see him in a lot of mock drafts going uh, to the Raiders in either the first or second round. And as we stated, Lynch is gone. The Raiders need to fix that offense and, and really, you know, retool it, uh, quite frankly. Are you, I, I, and I, this is a bit of a leading question, Dave, and I kind of know how you're going to answer it, but we've seen the Alabama running backs come into the NFL, and they've had up and down careers. Mark Ingram took a while for him to get going. Eddie Lacy petered out pretty quick. Trent Richardson literally never got going. Um, you have two guys this year in, um, da not Damian Williams, who's the Damian, Damian Harris. Harris, thank yeah. you, uh, and Josh Jacobs coming in from Alabama. You like either of these guys for dynasty purposes, given the history of Alabama running backs, the recent history of Alabama running backs coming to the NFL. I, I, I really don't put anything into that recent history stuff. When you're talking about sample size of less than 10, it, it doesn't play to my analysis whatsoever. That's like, say, I was, on football guys' message boards, I commented about uh, they said Ozzie Newsom has a terrible history of drafting wide receivers. So he's drafted 13 wide receivers in the top 130 picks in the past since in 18 years as a GM. His first one was I think Travis Taylor, and then uh, a couple guys like in the 20s. You know, one of them was uh, Perriman, and he just hasn't really hit on any of them. But I mean, it's he hasn't spent a lot of draft capital on them. So anyway, the point is that you have a lot of Alabama running backs that come out. What if Saquon Barkley last year had just happened to have gone to Alabama? Does that mean that oh well now he sucks? No, he's a, he's a person, he's a player. I was, you know, wasn't really happy with how Josh Jacobs performed in the combine. He didn't do much of the combine, I didn't think. Oh, that's right, he's right. So I, I mean, he, he had this measurable, or he had the... Um, the pro day or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The pro day was not, whatever, his measurables are not all that impressive. Right. Uh, but a lot of people still like him, a lot of pundits like him. Catches passes. He does. I, I don't know, I'm not, not a huge fan. I don't like the running back class in general. Damian Harris, I could maybe get into a little bit later, but as a cheaper rookie pick. I'm not really interested in Josh Jacobs, that's all. One of the things we've talked about on this show when it comes to rookie drafts over the years is when we talk about a player who could not beat out a certain other player that made it to the NFL um, and, and performed at a subpar level. Uh, he couldn't get the lion's share of touches um, in his collegiate offense because of another player who was not as good that was still getting a lot of um, – play and in, 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 in touches in the backfield. So my question to you is, getting back to this Alabama thing, is the Alabama backfield just that talented that Josh Jacobs really wasn't used there that much? Or is there something to the fact that, you know, he couldn't shake these other guys and, and we've seen, you know, Damian Harris and, and Najee Harris, I think was the other guy, the, the, um, the five-star overall recruit, um, got a lot of run last year. How do you fall in on this? Is this just an uber-talented backfield, or do, should we have concerns about Josh Jacobs' talent level? Uh, I think when you're sharing time like that, it, 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 it's a little bit of a red flag, but it is Alabama. So because they have so many talented backs, it's just tough for somebody there to get a huge market share of yards and touchdowns. So I really can't fault Jacobs for that. And look, I just took a look at his numbers. He did not run at the combine. The second, he had two pro days. The second one, he ran 4.52 and 4.5640s. So if you add a half second to that, he's around 4.6. So then you're looking at comps like Kareem Hunt on the good side and Noshan Moreno on the bad side. Wolf. And, you know, there's a, and there's a lot of Noshan Morenos that are just not that great. Yeah, you have to temper that with him. If he does get drafted in the first round, that's, that's obviously a, a nice thing. He's the first back drafted. I, you know, again, 
I'm not all that super interested in him. I wouldn't think I would take him number one. I'd probably take the receivers first. That was my next question. But if, I, but if I had, you know, like the 105, 106 pick and he was there and the Raiders took him, it would, you know, you'd have to take a look at it at, at the very least. Also, by the way, the Raiders, because it's so obvious, they should maybe consider trading up from 24 to like 19 if they really want him. Because anyone that really wants Jacobs can just trade up to 22 or 23 and snatch him out right, from right in front of them. Can I throw a hypothetical at you? Sure. We've talked about sometimes the best way to rate these rookies is how the NFL rates them. In other words, rookie ADP should match up with real life ADP for the most part. Okay? Yeah. What happens if Jacob slips a little? Oh, let's let no, doesn't slip a little. Let's say he get, he does go to the Raiders at 24. He's obviously they want him to be the bell cow there. Okay. Right, and he's the first back taker. What happens if the receivers slip? Okay. What happens if Marquise Brown goes after 24? What if DK Metcalf goes after 24? Josh Jacobs' first skill position, I mean, outside of the tight ends, is, is the first running back slash receiver off the board. How much of a threat is he if you own the 101 to be your selection there? Well, if you, you have people that need running backs have to consider him. And if you don't like Jacobs, if I had the 101 and I wanted, and I have his okay at running back, I would consider then trading the pick to trade down a little bit. But, you know, again, I, I don't want to totally dog on the guy like he's going to be terrible. Right. If they're going to give him the ball 300 times and he catches passes, even a team that's as bad historically as the Raiders have been, they will probably get better. They can't probably get a whole lot worse. Uh, now they got Mayak in town. Nah, that's true. No longer announcing, make him pick there. That's right. Uh, well, allegedly, or he's just agreeing with whatever John Gruden says, right. which is probably has as equal amount of likelihood of, of going oh, on there. You know, I would, wouldn't you, I would just hate to be, you know, like you get irritated with conversations. I would just hate to listen to Gruden talk, to have to listen to that conversation. Whatever Mayak can't stand him. I, you know, I think they're both old school throwback football guys. They probably actually enjoy each other's company, but once the losses pile up, that may not be the case anymore. Yeah. Hey, we got Monty fan coming up, uh, 2018 FFPC Bare Knuckle Challenge. One more point I want to make before we get to Monty. Matt Miller from Bleacher Report has ranked his uh, ranked his uh, players for the for the rookie class. A.J. Brown is 14th overall, a six foot, 226 pound receiver from Ole Miss. Uh, he has him above Nikhil Harry, Marquise Brown, D.K. Metcalf, Debo Samuel, Paris Campbell, and Hakeem Butler, all those wideouts are inside his top 50, but A.J. Brown is number one on all of them. And i got to tell you, Dave, um, we talked about this on the show with Leo and Balky on the score this afternoon. He is my number one receiver in this draft, too. I would take him A.J. Brown. At AJ Brown. Um, I don't like Marquise Brown uh, as much as a lot of other people do. I for sure don't like D.K. Metcalf as a lot of other people do. Uh, if I, from a dynasty standpoint, if I had my rookie draft before the NFL draft, and I'm taking a receiver. A.J. Brown is my guy. I'm really a big fan of him. I think he's going to be a very, very successful pro no matter where he goes. Your thoughts on A.J. Brown? Do you share my, do you share my optimism on the Ole Miss receiver that outperformed D.K. Metcalf when they're on the same team? I do like Brown, I think, ahead of Metcalf, even though Metcalf's got that super explosiveness. Um, I, I like Andy Kiel Harry ahead of, ahead of Brown. He would be my number one receiver. And I do, I love Andy Isabella, and I don't care what anyone does. That's fine. Hey. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I think Isabella, he's going to be able to play in the slot, but I think he can play outside too. And I, I think by the time the drafts come around, he's going to be like a top 12 rookie pick. Okay. And so now he's one of the mid second, late second. But everyone, everyone, not everyone, but I'd say eight players out of 12 in every, any dynasty league kind of have a big thing for Isabella. So he's going to be getting overdrafted for, or properly drafted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or even more overdrafted. Um, I, forgive me if you said his name. Hakeem Butler's been one of the most polarizing receivers in this year's class. Are you pro-Butler or anti-Butler? I like Butler. I mean, Waldman loves Butler, and I have to respect Waldman when he really puts out an opinion that strongly about somebody. I really have to give him the respect. Yeah, he does write a thousand pages, and it's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of words there. Uh, so I have to give him some respect. So I, I, I do like Butler. Uh, I guess I'll have to see where he gets picked, you know what I mean? I, I do put a lot into the draft capital where he's getting selected. Speaking of football guys, Sigmund Bloom made this point about when he and Matt Waldman were talking about Hakeem Butler a couple weeks ago, and I, I hadn't considered this. Um, Hakeem Butler crushed Big 12 defenses this year, ran all over him, tons of yards after the catch, got wide open, had a fantastic uh, 2019 season. And people say, well, look at the competition that he was going against. You know, it, I mean, it's, it's weak. It's, it's not that great. You know, he's not gonna... And Sigmund Bloom brought up the point well, if it was that easy and it's so bad, then everybody should be doing what he did. <laughs> everybody should be putting up these kind of numbers, and they weren't. Butler was the outlier, or he's one of the outliers. Right, right. So, yeah, interesting point. 
I think I'm pro Butler. We'll see how it shakes out. Let's talk to somebody way more knowledgeable than us on this, Dave. Uh, tonight's guest has uh, taken part in high stakes fantasy football leagues since 2009, bouncing around with various co owners. He joined a group of three other friends back in 2014. Since then, his group has finished ahead in winnings every single year, including 16th place overall in the FFPC main in 2014 and won four consecutive FFPC main event league titles from 2015 through 2018. Second place in the bare knuckle in 2015, but in 2017, he was the main event regular season points winner and the bare knuckle champion from 2018. Please welcome back into the show, rotoviz.com's newest lead writer, Monty Fan. Thanks for coming on the show again tonight, man. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. This is uh, exciting. We're going, we're, we're going into the NFL draft. We, we, we get you on tonight fresh off uh, uh, a title at, at the high stakes level, one of the ancillary leagues we have out in Vegas. And uh, we get to talk to you about some dynasty stuff tonight, too. So I'm very excited uh, about that. Getting back to bare knuckle. Now, for anybody who's not familiar with this, you can't use notes. You, you can't have a computer. This is basically all from memory. So you really got to be dialed in not only the players' names, players' roles, but also ADP on this as well. Monty, when you were doing this bare knuckle challenge in 2018 of the league which you ended up winning, how do you prep for, for a league like that? I mean, my, my mind would just be spinning trying at, at the even thought of, of trying to get through 28 rounds with 12 other teams in, in this draft. How did you prep for it, man? Uh, well, I think the biggest thing is uh, I don't drink. I'm not a drinker. So uh, sometimes <laughs> it is it is funny. I uh, it's uh it it takes place right after the Thursday night game, and um, you know some guys have had a few uh, by the time the draft starts, uh, so maybe I have a little bit of an advantage there. Um, but I uh, I tell you the 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 biggest well the thing that I've done each year I've done it for four years is um, I try to memorize the first thirty six guys uh, in ADP. And um, it's hard because that 30-second timer per pick goes pretty quickly. And when you're trying to mentally pick guys off in your head, um, it's a little bit challenging. But uh, it does kind of keep me calm. I, have, I get anxious at these things. And, um, and then it's just... I pick out every round. I look at the ADP and I pick out two or three guys in each round and just try to mentally associate them with that round uh, instead of, you know, trying to memorize an entire draft. And uh, what really helped me uh, last year was we did uh, a draft in the super bracket on Thursday morning and we had the seventh pick. And uh, that night, for the bare knuckle, uh, before the, the draft, you, uh, everyone, all the 12 guys draw a uh, playing card, and you get to pick your draft, spit, draft spot before the draft starts. So you don't even know where you're drafting before the draft starts. And uh, I got the uh, first pick, and I took sixth. And the draft from that morning was still pretty fresh in my mind, and if I panicked uh and a guy that we had taken that morning was still there on the board for the bare knuckle draft i just ended up taking him so it kind of uh centered me a little bit so that's really smart i like both i like a lot of those ideas sometimes it's it, it you know just making making the whole draft board smaller actually ends up paying off you know you don't have to memorize three four hundred players just you know memorize w whatever it is you know like a hundred ninety of them whatever and and you're, yeah, you're probably in the clear on that yeah, memorize the guys you want and just kind of ignore the guys you know you don't want. And it's uh, when you're doing it, um, obviously there's going to be panic moments. And uh, the Falcons and Eagles had played that night. And the board, I could see Freeman on the board. And it was actually Royce Freeman, but I, I couldn't see the first name. It was too tiny. I thought it was Devontae, and <laughs> Devontae Freeman got picked. And when you have a teammate pick, so immediately Devontae Freeman was picked. It made me think of Tevin Coleman, and so he was my next pick. He ended up being pretty good. But then 
Uh, later on, someone took Cooper Cup, and that reminded me that Robert Woods was still on the board. So, you know, a couple picks later, I had taken Woods. So, uh, you do get your memory jogged during the draft. So, that's pretty good stuff. Yeah. So you also in that draft, you ended up with four kickers as well as four quarterbacks. Was that uh, did you kind of plan for that, or were you just kind of uh, scrambling a little bit late and like, oh, let me just uh, take a fourth QB here? That is uh, something I picked up from an old Rotoviz story, um, just to plug them. Uh, it, it it had to deal with variance. Um, first of all, let's take a defense. You know, the year before Jacksonville was good, they were a pretty low-ranked defense. Uh, last year, it happened to be that the Colts were typically the last defense off the board. And they were actually, a, uh, I think, a top 10 scoring defense last year for FFPC scoring. And you never know when these defenses are going to hit. Um, so if you can take three or four over the course of the season, you're probably adding three to five points per week. So if you think of 16 weeks, you can add probably 50 to 75 points just by taking uh, a third or fourth defense. Um, and with kickers, it was even more important because the last few years, there's just been a, a massive turnover. You know, it seemed like a kicker was getting cut once a week. And uh, if you only take two, then you are in danger of, of putting up a zero at that position on certain weeks, which is the killer for trying to stay in a contention in a, in a best ball league. So in that, I, I definitely uh, look to taking four kickers, um, you know, and then maybe settle on three defenses. Four, if the, the other thing with this bare knuckle is if you've got 30 defenses off the board and you're not tracking them, and you know there are two left. <laughs> you have to, I have to mentally go through every division, you know, I can think of and see which of those two uh, are missing. Uh, so I do try to take them early just to get that panic situation out of the way. But And, and quarterbacks, too, quarterbacks and tight ends. Um, I got stuck uh, in 2017. Uh, a couple of my quarterbacks got hurt, and I was down to one. And I didn't want that to happen. And so rookie QBs are a great way of just kind of padding that quarterback position. Josh Allen was a huge one for me uh, nice. with those, uh, with yeah, his run toward the end of the year. And uh, same with tight ends. Um, you know, if you get down to, to one guy, and, and as we saw last year, there was just a ton of turnover in that tight end position. Uh, so, you know, I try to take three or four at that at those spots too. Just you know, kind of throws. Throw throw Jason, Jason Witten's back for you this year. You can grab him. That's, That's right. right. That's yeah, right. <laughs> Mr. Volunteer volunteering his services back to uh, the Dallas Cowboys for sure. We're talking with Monty Fan, the yeah. 2018 FFPC Bare Knuckle Challenge winner. Tyler Boyd was actually a great pick for you in this league, uh, league uh, last year. Monty had a career year for the Bengals. Uh, I'm curious, what what did you like about him uh, that that intrigued you to to select him in this uh, draft? And do you see a similar player in FFPC drafts right now? I, I know you've done some work on on the FFPC best ball uh, ADP. Is there a similar player to to Boyd that you think uh, fantasy owners need to be concentrating on and, and targeting? Uh, yeah, Boyd was a guy. Um, again, not to keep plugging him, but um, Sean Siegel. Uh, on Rotoviz had 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 tossed in there that he was taking Tyler Boyd uh, with the last pick in a lot of his drafts, and um, that really stuck with me. And we ended up taking him on uh, either we drafted him or got him in, in waivers on a couple um, high stakes uh, main event team, and then yeah, I ended up taking him and AJ Green in that uh, bare knuckle draft. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I'm always on the lookout for, you know, 
kind of nuggets like that. Um, and as far as this year, uh, I mean, Boyd was really just kind of a, uh, end of the draft pick. I'm, I'm not sure there's a, another guy who's similar, but I know that Devin Funches has gotten, you know, a lot of flack from his time in, in Carolina, and he's in uh, Indianapolis now where a lot of people say, you know, could we see another um, Eric Ebron similar type of situation where a guy who was maligned, you know, goes to Indy and uh, becomes a big red zone target, getting passes from Andrew Luck, and, um, you know, he's a, he's a big guy in the red zone too, so... I don't know if he can perform to the same extent as Tyler Boy, but he's definitely a guy that is on my radar. Um, I don't have off the top of my head where he's going in, in drafts now, but uh, he's, he's definitely a guy I'll keep an eye on. Yeah, I can tell you right now, Monty, he is actually going at the 12.05 in, in, in FFPC oh. best ball right now is, is, is Funchess. So, I mean, certainly you're, you're not investing a whole lot in, in him right there, and, and yeah. it would make a lot of sense to, to grab Funchess there, uh, at least in a few leagues, and, and, and take some shots at it. So, obviously, the Boyd pick worked out. That was something that you did differently than, well, every other owner in the Bare Knuckle Challenge last year. <laughs> but you guys have been doing really good in the main event. Dave wants to talk to you about that. Yeah, so you won four consecutive main event league titles. How many how many teams a year do you guys usually play? If you don't mind me asking, like main event teams. Uh, only one. Last year was the first time we did two teams in the main event, and the second team was a disaster. <laughs> you funny. can't win them all. Yeah, <laughs> that's really, that's really true. that's truly very impressive. So, I mean, what, do you think you're doing any certain things better or differently than a lot of other players? And I'm gonna kind of ask you. About the Week 12 buy, I think if you'll bring that up sometimes. Oh, yeah. This year, the Cardinals, Chiefs, Chargers, and Vikings are on a buy in Week 12. Do you guys kind of ignore that, or do you, do you let that play into your uh, your equation of who to draft? No, I don't put much stock in it. Last year, the Chiefs had a Week 12 buy last year as well, and uh, we still drafted Kelsey everywhere we could. Um, I mean, you know, Week 12 is the first week of the playoffs, but you got to make it there. And, right. um, you know, having, you know, the other side of it is for all 11 weeks of the, or Mahomes or, you know, Tyreek Hill, well, not sure about him, but <laughs> we'll see all those Chiefs <laughs> that you wanted. Yeah, we'll see. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not passing on Mahomes because he may not play week 12, uh, especially if I get him weeks 1 to 11 and pretty much don't have to worry about a backup for the entire season. So, uh, no, I don't I don't put too much stock in the buys. Um, but as far as our success in the main event, um, I don't know, just paying a lot of attention to it. Uh, I have the luxury of that. Um, staying on top of the waivers. Uh, we've just been lucky enough to draft pretty deep teams uh, with um, deep benches. And uh, I think last year we uh, – the probably the biggest one was uh, Nick Chubb. And, you know, he sat on our bench for probably half the regular season. And then they traded Hyde, and uh, he really came through for us in the bye week. And – I honestly, he, he may have been a candidate to drop for us early in the season. Uh, I don't remember. But, uh, so, you know, there is always uh, some luck that plays into it. Um, but, yeah, I think for us just paying attention, there's a group of four of us. And I don't know if I ran the team by myself that I would have the same kind of success because it's just nice to have three other people to bounce uh, lineup decisions off of and bounce waiver wire decisions off of and uh, kind of keeps everybody level and uh, we all have a pretty good relationship and think along the same lines and yeah I mean that's pretty much the secret of it I don't know that I can be more specific unfortunately 
That's good stuff. Yeah, it is uh, for sure. Monty fan, the 2018 FFPC Bare Knuckle Challenge champion, joining us on our NFL Draft Preview episode here on the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour. Eric Balkman and Dave Gerzak coming at you. And Monty, in addition to your BKC championship, you also cashed in 500 Dynasty League number 27 in the FFPC. Third place there. Talk a little bit about the trade you made a few weeks ago. Uh, you, you swap out Damian Williams from the Kansas City Chiefs. You get the Packers lead running back, or quote-unquote lead running back, in Aaron Jones in return. What went into that trade? Why did you want to make that deal? Um, it was actually, I think I was trying to get, um, who was it now? Uh, I had made him an offer. Uh, I think I was trying to get Rashad Penny and uh, Chris Godwin off of him. And uh, he just kind of, well, Damian Williams and Aaron Jones were included in it. And he just kind of shot back. I I have Hyde. Uh, I'll give you Williams for Jones. And uh, that worked for me. I feel like um, I feel like Aaron Jones is a little sleepery. Um, I also feel that Damian Williams will have some competition with Hyde being there because they have similar skill sets. And uh, I felt like I was selling high on him in a way. Uh, he performed fantastically at the end of the year and pretty much at Kareem Hunt's same level. Um, but, you know, I don't know if they're going to add anyone. And uh, Jones seems to be a pretty good fit and on pretty solid ground there in Green Bay. I don't think Jamal Williams will challenge him that much. So uh, that was my question. Behind that one. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely agree with you. I, and I think Dave, I know Dave is a fan of, of Aaron Jones as well, if for no other reason than the fact that, that there are a lot of people out there that do not care for him and, and do have a lot of questions about him. But he's clearly the back to own uh, in Green Bay right now. I really can't see that changing uh, over the course of the weekend. I think Green Bay adds a third running back, but I don't think they do it on. They, they probably won't do it in the first two rounds. They might do it in round three. I think it's more likely a day three pick that they that they bolster that running back depth there. So I think Aaron Jones is, uh, as you point out, it, it pointed out, it, he is a little sleepery uh, right now. Landing spot is going to play a big role this weekend uh, with all these rookies. But when you look at the skill position players at the NFL draft this year, Monty, does it seem like it's it's a deep class? for dynasty drafters, but not necessarily a top-heavy one? I mean, that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Are you seeing it the same way, or are you seeing it differently? Yeah. Uh, I mean, from what I've read, um, it doesn't seem – yeah, there's no – obviously there's no Saquon Barkley or Zeke Elliott or even Leonard Fournette in the class. It doesn't seem like um, – Last year's class was great for running backs. It doesn't seem like this year's is that that great. I tend to pay most attention uh, right after the, the NFL draft to see where it all shakes out. I um, it's it's hard for me to I guess synthesize all of the information about the prospects without the key, you know info being where they actually end up. So I, I, I kind of wait until after that happens to see where people start ranking guys um, after the actual draft. Um, so I, there's no one really that I'm, you know, uh, avoiding or really aiming for at the moment. But, yeah, my general feeling is, uh, you know, it's it's the the ADP is probably going to be all over the place. Uh, I'm in a ton of leagues, and uh, yeah, there's probably it's going to come down to personal preference for a lot of these, and and a lot of it's not set in stone. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, more bullets in the chamber is probably the answer here. If you, if you can pick up a, a second round pick here or there, you never know when when it could pay off. So I'm I'm with you on that. 
We uh, we have some time uh, here. I want to sneak in one email, and, and this is kind of uh, to your point that you were just making, Monty, where, where, where we obviously we want an old landing spot for these guys, and, and we will shortly. Uh, but John in Longview, Texas writes, who is the team to watch in round one that could take a running back that might turn into the 101 pick for Dynasty. Nice work in the bare knuckle, man. That is John in Longview, Texas. Thanks for the email, John. This is interesting because Dave and I talked about Josh Jacobs before, and Dave says he's not necessarily considering Jacobs if, if he does go in the first round at the 101. But if he is the first skill position off the board, I think it's something that you have to look at. Is there a team in round one? I mean, maybe it's the Raiders, maybe it's somebody else that you are looking at, 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 hey, when they're on the clock, I need to pay attention because if they take a running back here, he could end up being the 101 this year for rookie drafts. Mm. Uh, that's a tough one. I am personally uh, not a big fan of taking running backs at the 101. I mean, I would have taken Barkley. I would have taken Elliott. Um uh, I had the 101, and I passed on Gurley and uh, took uh, Mari Cooper instead. I I just I lean toward wide receivers because I feel like they're more stable and their value lasts longer. Um, so I'm going to be completely honest and say that I'm not totally sure that there is a, a guy, a running back, uh, who I would take at the 101, but um, I mean, I could definitely see a case for the Raiders taking a guy at 101. I mean, you have uh, Lynch just retired and Crowell has, you know, kind of been mediocre. Um, And, uh, you know, they got Antonio Brown there now. And um, yeah, I think that offense could, could benefit from a, a rookie running back enough that he could be considered at the 101. I'm definitely, but, um, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I'm definitely looking at Oakland. I, I think that's that's one. I, I think Tampa's picking too high, and I still own Ronald Jones in too many leagues, so I'm, you know, I'm, like, I'm just like yeah. self, selfishly eliminating them from the conversation. Philadelphia is another interesting one, too. We'll, we'll see what they do. I mean, you never know what – with Howie Roseman and, and, and all those guys, uh, how they're going to play the draft as well. But um, we'll see. And, and to Dave's point, I, I totally agree with him that, you know, the one he made uh, at the top of the show, I think we're going to see a lot of deals in on day one and, and especially day two of this draft. And we're going to see a lot of teams repositioning and positioning themselves uh, for, uh, for different skill position players. Monty, can you give us a guy uh, that you're actually going to be staying away from uh, in the early rounds? We'll put the, we'll focus this on redraft leagues. Uh, a guy that you're staying away from in the early rounds uh, next season, and then conversely, a guy that, that you think is a sleeper that, you know, maybe is a mid-round pick, maybe a double-digit pick that you think could break out and be a huge difference maker for FFPC players in 2019. Um, I'm not sure at this point there's a guy I'm really, you know, shying away from. Um, it. it there were guys over the last few years like Marshawn Lynch who, you know, have been, I think, going in the third and fourth and fifth, and he just seemed like he was past his prime. Um, I was looking just down at the ADP. Um, and no one really stood out at me as uh, as a guy I'm looking to avoid. I do know that I feel like you know, in one quarterback standard, you know, four points per pass, passing touchdown league, uh, my guess is Mahomes will go way too high for my liking. Um, and, uh, I mean, for me, everything depends on ADP. You know, if a guy drops far enough and becomes a value, if he was previously on my, you know, kind of a void list, I would definitely take a look at him uh, if he has fallen far. But, uh yeah, I mean, I'd probably go back to, to you know, the two guys we talked about earlier. Damian Williams is a guy that will probably, at least right now, things might change after the draft, but um, looks to me to be going too high. 
And uh, Aaron Jones is a guy who looks to me like he's going too low. There you go. Yeah, I like, I, I, I like it, and I, and I think I'm, uh, I, you know, even though Damian Williams is going in the mid-third right now, um, that could look really, really bad if Kansas City invests in a, in a decent running back this weekend. We'll, well see. Well, they did trade away their first and second round picks to Clark. Oh, that's right, yeah, for Frank Clark, so, yeah. So it does help. That does help Williams a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, little bit. yeah, absolutely. That's a good, that's a great point. I didn't think of that. Uh, but Aaron Jones, uh, I'm with you on that. Uh, him being undervalued right now. You I know, had Jared for Terry last year as a running back. Yeah, and, and honestly, the, you know, the biggest thing has just been the, that those knee injuries. Um, he's going at the 402 right now. I can definitely get on board with him there. Dave, uh, final question for Monty, who's been incredibly gracious tonight with his time. Yeah, tell us a little bit about your new position at RotoViz. You know, we're big fans of RotoViz. We have it for a number of years. And uh, what you're working on now is when, uh, what about uh, what's coming out over the summer as well, Fight? Yeah, um, they named about a half dozen lead riders, and so I was uh, fortunate to be uh, named one of them. And uh, my big focus is uh, you guys, FFPC, high stakes content. Um, I've been doing a series of just looking at uh, ADP, uh, particularly in, in best ball leagues. Uh, since uh, they started up right after, right around the Super Bowl. So I looked at it, um, I took a look before free agency started, and then another look after free agency uh, had kind of shaken out. I'm going to do one uh, after some of the dynasty rookie drafts get underway and see where the rookies have started falling in uh, ADP. And then probably uh, another one midsummer, and then uh, around training camp, and just kind of focusing on high stakes stuff throughout the summer. You can go to rotoviz.com right now and read Monty's latest piece. This took place um, uh, in ADP analysis. Took place, you know, basically after all the free big free agent signings after the Odell Beckham trade. His analysis there uh, on that, and follow him on Twitter at Monty Fan. He is the 2018 FFPC Bare Knuckle Champion. Won four consecutive FFPC main event leagues, including the 2017 uh, main event regular season points championship. Congratulations on all your success. Congratulations on the new position with Rotoviz, Monty. Don't be a stranger. We will continue reading your stuff. And I uh, wish you best of luck in all your leagues in 2019. And thanks so much for coming on the show again this week. All right. Thank you for having me. Monty fan, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, great stuff from him. And uh, always good to get the insight uh, of a player who has had not only a great high-stakes career, uh, but a guy who uh, has had a lot of recent success and is now covering it for rotoviz.com. As Dave said, we're, we're big fans of that. And, and anytime we get the melding of the FFPC and rotoviz, always a winning combination, David. Very funny. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, good stuff from Monty. We have roughly 13 minutes left in the show. I know you have an early morning, man. If I can get out a couple minutes early, I'm going to do that. We have four emails I'd like to We're get good. to. No problem. Um, well, maybe, oh. I'm, not, I'm not in that big of a row. In that case, we might have five emails. Let me see here. Uh, okay, yeah, here's one. Uh, let's kick things off. Rich in Mobile, Alabama. Hey, guys, is DK Metcalf, Marquise Brown, or someone else your top-rated dynasty wide receiver in this draft? I feel like, thank you for the email, Rich, by the way. I feel like I've already answered this. I like A.J. Brown best for Dynasty, and, and I know, again, with this, it, it's kind of silly because we're doing this show the day before a lot of this stuff will change when we know role and, and, and what have you. It, who is your favorite? Nikhil Harry. Nikhil Harry, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, you said that before. I'm going to call him Nikhil. Nikhil? <laughs> yeah, great stuff. From Arizona State, what is it about him? I know he's a big guy with a big catch radius. He obviously put up good numbers at Arizona State. What else uh, intrigues you about him? Was it the spark score? Do you have, I don't even know what his measurables were he as far ran, as that goes. He ran pretty well, actually. Uh, he, he was very productive at a young age. I don't have the phenom score numbers or anything, but I, I have a feeling he'd be pretty far up there. And I love, I love wide receivers that, that do well at a young age. Uh, Sammy Watkins was one that, unfortunately, he's you know he's had injuries and hasn't really panned out as much. But uh, you know, DJ Moore, uh, Tyler Boyd actually had a really good phenom score as well. And so these are the types of players that that I that I like, and I think that Harry Kruby can play outside as well. It just it just he, was, he makes a lot of good contested catches. You know, that was this concern that his speed wasn't there, but he ran really well at the combine, so I think he's fine. Let me ask you this: I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you to your word here, Dave. 
If Nikhil Harry sneaks into the first round of the NFL draft, are you more often than not taking him at the 101 in your dynasty rookie draft then? I mean, I don't have any 101 picks, but I would, yeah. Well, yes. I mean, not, I'm not Obviously, saying, listen, we, well, we know I'm you would saying, never finish last in your dynasty league. That's, well, that's clear. By the way, a lot of times I just finished last. So right, I get it. Yeah. But I, don't, I, didn't make any, I also didn't make any really smart trades and get the 101. I right. That. Well, there you that's go. stupid. Yeah. I have a 101, but I earned it. <laughs> but I got it the hard way uh, for that go. So, yeah, I like A.J. Brown. Dave likes an N. Keel Harry uh, for that. Let's go to Rising Sun, Maryland. It's Mike. What are you guys doing with Josh Gordon? in Dynasty. Now, he was in the news today, Dave, signing that restricted free agent um, uh, offer from... Second round tender. Yeah, second round tender on this. Um, God only knows. I don't own Gordon anywhere. I know last time we talked about this, you actually still owned him in a few leagues. I don't know if you still have him anywhere. I have two Gordon. And what are you doing? I was trying to trade him away or give him away and no one would take him, so I'm just... I'm hanging on to him unless I really have to cut him. Somebody offers you the 212 for Gordon, 212 rookie pick. Would you do that? I think I would right now, yeah. Anywhere in the third round. That's getting a little bit on. That's, that's yeah. sort of where it is for me, too. I would def any, any way, if I own Gordon, I would easily swap him for any pick in the second round right now. Third round gets a little bit dicey. I think I'd rather have Gordon at that point. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's weird because it doesn't sound like it, but there's people at, the, there's players at the 212, 24 picks in. They're worth flyers. They're worth taking a shot on. Right. And some of them might not even be flyers. You'd be looking at Irv Smith, right? So a guy like that, he's a reasonably – he's up there, one of the top tight ends. And you Could get, be a first-round pick. Yeah, well, in, in that case, he's probably not going to go with the 212, right? right? But, you know, I'm just saying that there's players that are going to drop that, you, that people really like, that I really like. So I, I think, why not? One of my favorite things I like to do on this show, Dave, is ask you loaded questions you're not prepared for. I'm about to do it again. Irv Smith goes to New England at whatever it is, 32, okay? No Rob Gronkowski. In an FFPC tight end premium league, how high should Irv Smith be going if indeed he is the heir apparent to Rob Gronkowski in Foxborough? <laughs> is he a top five rookie pick? In FFPC league? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because Brady's so old and Belichick, you really don't know what's going to happen no, in five years. No, you don't, no. But I think he might be, yeah. I think there's, there's a possibility of that. He would okay. Let's say for 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 um. It depends on where fans and how. That, that was my that was my point. Let's say for argument's sake, those guys go before, uh, Irv Smith. Could we see three tight ends go in the top five? I don't think so. No. Okay. I, I, I got excited there for a I second. Think top seven or top eight. Possibly. Okay. But I think you, you, the running backs and receivers are going to get mixed in there. They're going to have to. It's, the receivers for sure. Running yeah. backs. I mean, J- if Jacobs we'll goes in the first round, he's still he's a first round back. I mean, that's a big deal. Is, hold on, I have, uh, okay, th- this is perfect because I was just going to ask you this question, and I'm going to let Jim in Caroga Lake, New York, ask you. Dear Todd and Saquon, do you guys have a favorite running back? By the way, do you get that reference? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Do you guys have a favorite running back? Todd Gurley and Saquon Park. <laughs> do you guys have a favorite running back in the draft this year? Thank you. That is Jim in Caroga Lake, New York. Now, it doesn't necessarily, I'm going to answer this like this. It doesn't necessarily have to be, like my my top ranked running back, um, as far as my favorite goes, my favorite is definitely not Josh Jacobs. You know who I think my favorite running back in this draft is? I can guess. And he has shot up. Daryl Henderson. No. Damn. He has shot up draft boards, like rookie draft ADP for people who've already had rookie drafts throughout the season. He has shot up within the last, I can't remember, it, I think it was Ryan McDowell actually put this out on Twitter. Miles Sanders. Miles Sanders, ah! Miles Sanders from Penn State. You take away the fumbling issues he's had. I mean, there's no Saquon Barkley, but you take away the fumbling issues that he's had there. Man, does he look good for a modern NFL fantasy running back. And, and I think if he does go in round two or even round three, Dave, he could be a top 25 running back in his rookie year. It, that, it's possible. I need those things to happen. Sanders and Daryl Henderson, I had mentioned him. Yeah. I'm interested in both of those back. They'd probably be the guys that I like that in the spots I'm kind of drafting. Jake, I mean, if Jacobs goes first, he's got to be, I don't know, he has to be for me first. I, as much as I like the other guys, if I'm taking a running back and Jacobs goes before them by 20, 30 picks, whatever, I'm going to take Jacobs almost for sure. Unless, unless I don't I can't think of a better landing spot than Oakland. But if it's some, you know, if, let's say. Philadelphia. Let's say, let's say no. Oh, because they got Jordan Howard there. No, because they have coaches that shit. Oh, yeah. All yeah, the time. that's true. Yeah. 
Well, that's, that's my point with Howard. Is like you know whether you think he's good or not, they're going to use him. Yeah, exactly. That's just, anyway. I, I guess we'll just we have to Indianapolis. Yeah. Indianapolis. Marlon Mack. I don't think they want a running back. Marlon yeah. Mack's a pretty darn good back. Baltimore. I mean, they got Mark Ingram now, but I think I think any rookie's gonna have a tough time beating out Ingram. Ingram's a darn good running he back. He is too. good. Yeah. There's a there's a, there's opportunities out there. We're just probably not thinking of them right now. Let me let me ask. Okay, oh, my two twelve pick guy. Yeah. Would be Bryce Love, the guy who's I was just asking about him. Yeah, coming off the injury, granted, he's maybe not that great this year. Maybe he loses explosiveness. Maybe not. He was a phenomenal running back when uh, the year before. So why not take him as a two twelve three hundred one? And that's definitely worth more than Josh Gordon to me right now. Um, to, to your point with with injured running backs, a guy that was mocked as a potential first round pick before the injuries this season, Rodney Anderson from Oklahoma. This guy might not even get drafted, Dave, in the NFL draft. He could be a free agent signee. What about him at the end of the second round, early third round? Because I think a player like him, you could say that he's, he's sort of got the pedigree because the only thing, the, the reason he dropped was because he basically missed the entire season because of the injury, and, and this is, hasn't been his first injury. Uh, but you look at a guy like him, I, I think he could be a potential difference maker in, and, and be a better pro than collegian. Absolutely possible, and it's- Whatever team gets him as a free agent or a seventh round pick or whatever, you have to look at the opportunity there. And if there is opportunity, then yeah, absolutely, you have to take a look at it. Last running back I want to talk to you about. I think he went to the FIU, uh, Devin Singletary. Um, I, I am saying his name right, right? It's not Tevin or Devon. <laughs> it is Devin Singletary. Yeah, I think so. All right, thank you. Um, that guy, if I remember correctly, game tape off the charts, looks awesome. Measurables, combine, mm, the opposite of awesome. Was not great. Did not perform well at, at that point. And, you know, some running backs are just not cut out for, for the measurables. That's not their game. That's not how they get it done. Uh, your thoughts on Singletary in, in Dynasty this year? I don't think he goes in the first round of rookie drafts. Maybe a fringe first round pick, but I think he's more locked into the second round. No, I have no interest whatsoever in him. He's 5'7", 20, this is from the combine. Right. 5'7", 203, 4'6", 6'40". So his speed score is awful. 15 bench press reps. I'm not bragging, but I could do 15 bench press reps on the 225. That is bragging. Okay, good. All right. 35 inch vertical. My vertical is probably in the 20s. Maybe it is 20. Um, oh, well, you've got to have a higher vertical. I'm, I'm totally kidding. I don't know. But uh, 7 3 2 3 cone and a 4 4 20 yard shuttle. Those are really, really bad right. numbers. So, sorry. No thanks. Outweighs I, the game tape for you. By the way, I do weigh more than 203, so to give Devin a little yeah, credit. close. Not, not. I wish I were closer. <laughs> nah, nah, whatever. Uh, all right, let's. Uh, okay, so this is sort of an expansion of a question that we've already answered, and and I don't know if I have a great answer for this. Joe in Grayling, Michigan. What's up, David Balky? I know it's probably a fool's errand, but with the draft four days away, well, much closer than that now. Who are your top three receivers in this year's class? That is Joe, in Grayling, Michigan. All right, so. We know Dave's is N. Keel Harry, number one. Uh, mine is A.J. Brown. I like him, number two. Um, I, it's difficult for me to, to pinpoint receivers after that because, to me, that they are so much alike. You, know, you have Brown and, and Samuel and, and – Mar- excuse me, Marquise Brown and Samuel and, and, uh, and Metcalf and um, – you know, all, all, all these other guys that are probably going to be going in the second round, quite frankly, Hakeem Butler, Paris Campbell uh, sneaking in there as well. I guess if I had to do it, I would, I would rank them. Um, I would probably go Br- A.J. Brown, Hakeem Butler, Nikhil Harry. I think that's how I would go with my top three right now. But, again, it's so – I mean, after A.J. Brown for me, there is a drop-off, and, and I just it, – it's difficult for me to, to – to say I'm going to die on this hill because they are so close. Uh, Andy Isabella, I know, might might be in your top three, Dave. <laughs> oh man, I don't know. It's. I mean, again, I'm going to have to go a little bit off the draft position too. I mean, I have to put. I, I, you have to. Harry, I'll have one. I mean, AJ Brown, King Butler, Metcalf. I have to consider Metcalf too. I mean, in that right. top three, they're yeah. all there. Isabella, I mean, if Isabella gets drafted in the third round, I think I still have to put him a little bit lower. I have, I have to almost, as much as I like him. Uh, so I'd put him maybe like fifth or fourth. What's the percentage chance Andy Isabella is a day two pick? I think it's pretty hard. Like high. 80 or 90? I think it's 80. Okay. I think maybe, well, maybe even higher. Okay. 
I think there's a I, there if he goes to get drafted in like the mid second round, like way early. Yeah, the game, then you yeah. At that point, it's like all right, watch out because this team loves the guy. Yeah. You know, and they're gonna use and and then you, you know the GMs are talking like you know what well, we consider him an outside player this and that blah 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 and you see what the opportunity looks like. Right. But then there's a chance he goes in the fourth round and, and no one really likes him for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean that, that and and like you said, there's a twenty percent chance of that happening. <laughs> there, there sure is. Final email. Uh, one, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. I, I also, I'm interested in that little Jordan Humphrey guy. Oh he's yeah. A, he's actually a big player. He's young. And, and his name's Lil Jordan. I love the name. The name is great. Right. Rotoviz has some interesting stuff on him, so I, I think. Where that, did he go to school? Do you know offhand? <laughs> I don't. Know. You do. You don't offhand. You're going to look it up right now. Texas. Um, Texas. Texas. Now. Uh, file this. Six four two twenty five. So yeah, I was just gonna ask you this. File this under I for ironic, but Lil Jordan Humphrey six four two twenty five. Ain't nothing little about that Jordan. He's gonna be a twenty one year old rookie. Yeah. Kind of like the, you know who's about that size and and age? Juju. Is Juju really that tall? Yeah, Juju. I think was six four, like two fifteen. Wow. I never really yeah, thought. Let me, let me look. I could be wrong. I I thought he was uh smaller than that, but I I you know I could be wrong. I drafted Juju Smith. Apparently six one, so apparently I'm totally wrong. Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, let's move on to Carl in Goodwell, Oklahoma. Dave, final email tonight. Assuming they la- oh, this is a good one. Assuming they land in similar situations, I feel like we've asked this question or tried to answer it uh, a lot, but this is a different way of phrasing it, I guess. Assuming they land in similar situations, who will you draft higher in rookie drafts, Hawkinson or Fant? Hope you guys get a chance to enjoy the draft. That is Carl in Goodwell, Oklahoma. Now, okay. Oh, this is uh, blowing my mind right now with, with that answer. If you would have asked me three weeks ago, it would have been very difficult for me to say. I would, have been, I, I would not have. Okay. And here's why. Hawkinson was consistently being mocked, not by one or two pundits, but numerous pundits in the top ten of the NFL draft. Noah Fant was like a fringe first-round pick. So to me, it's just like, okay, at that point, it's very difficult for me to say I'm willing to take Fant over Hawkinson. However, within the last week, I've seen Fant go in the top 15. I've seen him go in the top 10 in a few drafts. I've even, even seen him gone ahead of TJ Hawkinson. So now the question is, who do you take first if they're roughly going at the same spot? And I think I'm with you on Fant because from a fantasy perspective, I think Fant represents maybe the lower floor but unquestionably the higher ceiling. And, and that's my analysis on this. I don't know if you have anything to add of why you like Fant over Hawkinson. He is just a much better athlete, much better pass-catching player for the NFL. Hawkinson, to be honest with you, when I saw him at the combine, he just looked, he looked, I understand he's got to be a smooth athlete or something, but he, did, you know, he, he just looks like a guy. He, he doesn't look like I'll he tell you, plays football. Exactly. Great point. I mean, he, he is, is listed no at lower body he, size. He's at listed at six foot five, Dave. And the film I watched him, he looks like an H back. He looks like a fullback running wheel routes out of the out of the backfield. Well, tell me, I know he. I know he's supposed to be technically very sound. And there's, I mean, true in truth, truthfully, there's a lot to be said for that. Right. I mean, he if he gets his pad level below everybody else and is a great blocker, fantastic. Uh, FFP, FFP, we don't award points for that, so it doesn't really help. So. Right. I just don't know how great of a receiver he's going to be, especially compared to fans. Okay. All right. Well, fair enough. And, and hopefully that analysis will help you get ready for the NFL draft. Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for our show this week. I want to thank Monty fan, Dave Gerzak, the FFPC, Rob Rice, and, of course, each and every one of you. I want to wish a happy birthday to former guest of the show and multi-league main event league champ, Jeff, uh, champ, Jeff Haven Street, celebrating a birthday today. Happy birthday, Jeff. We will be back next Friday. With not one, not two, but coverage of three live drafts. That's right, Genesis, Revelations, and the newly minted Apocalypse draft. We will cover all three of those starting at 9, 8 central. So we'll be on an hour early next Friday. Uh, Obviously, a lot to talk about with the NFL draft being in the books. And we'll have live draft coverage from all three of those drafts. I think we'll go Genesis, Revelations, and Apocalypse in that order. Get in on those main event early birds, the football guys early bird uh, as well. They are, uh, it, it, listen, best deal you're going to get all season. Take advantage now. Maiden Dynasty in 2019 Best Ball League are live at myffpc.com. Check those out. Maiden Dynasty's firing off May 4th after our CD week after the NFL Draft. Your NFL Draft weekend starts now. This has been another episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by myffpc.com that was broadcast live and heard around the world. 
Eric and Dave will be back next week with more analysis, interviews, and advice from a guest much smarter than they are. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk with you again next week. We're on the team floor, even more so if we on tour. Me and E explore the country, wondering about the evening before. Trying to explain where the time went. Well, other rappers find a studio to grind in. Dave, I'm going to put the metaphorical gun to your head right now. Rapid fire, pun not intended. First tight end drafted in the NFL draft tomorrow is? I think it's going to be Hawkinson. First running back drafted in the NFL draft tomorrow night is? Jacobs. And first receiver drafted in the NFL draft tomorrow night is? I think Metcalf. Uh, all three of those, uh, so obviously those were the, the positions, but you think they all go Thursday night. Nobody slips to, to round two. Yeah, pretty sure. Like you're you're gonna we're not gonna see I mean I know we'll see a lot of guys in the first quarter. I don't care. <laughs> um but uh we're gonna see a lot of trench guys draft, a lot of pass rushers drafted. Mike there was a few years ago in the in the NFL draft where there was like hardly I think it was it the Tavon Austin year where there was like no position players draft. Oh no, it was the DeAndre Hopkins year. That's what it was. He was like the only position or skill guy. Drafted in the first round, it was it was brutal, and I was so right? I was hoping that wouldn't happen this year. But you feel pretty pretty confident it won't. I'm I'm pretty confident you'll you'll see a decent enough number of them. Day two is going to be great. Day three will be awesome. It's going to be a fantastic weekend. We can't wait for it. We'll talk to you again next Friday at nine eight central. Enjoy the draft, everyone. Thanks for listening.